And I would like to just say that I am really looking forward to this session and from hearing from both from to hearing from both Bev and Melanie. Um, I've worked with them both and I can say they are incredibly helpful, they're insightful and they are more than willing to share their time and their knowledge and their experience. And I personally found that incredibly beneficial uh, over the years. And I think that what's uh, interesting is that they're not just from Victoria. So Melanie has experience over in Adelaide as well in this similar field and Bev, as for some of you who might have heard our chat earlier, has a bit of an accent. So I'll leave you to guess where she's from, but she brings in a little bit of international um, knowledge as well and perspectives. Uh, so Bev is a very experienced data analyst and a family violence researcher. She is currently the lead data analyst with Evidence and Insights at the Department of Justice and Community Safety. Um, and she is responsible for what is now a fairly well established Victorian family violence database and the newer uh, COVID-19 family data portal, which is what she'll be talking us through in particular tonight. Melanie is the Assistant Director of Research and Evaluation at the Department of Justice and Community Safety, and she has a background in both crime and criminal justice research and evaluation. And she leads a program of work on data linkage, analytics and forecasting to support both policy and um, policy program and evaluation. And she's been with the department, I think, Melanie, for almost seven years now, you can correct me if that's wrong, um, but has some very valuable knowledge, uh, I guess, around the intricacies and the challenges of some of the data that is available across government and accessing that and using that to its, its full potential. And so with that quick summary, I will now hand you over to our two presenters. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kaz. Um, Bev is sharing some slides that we've put together hurriedly for this presentation due to busyness, but um, we, um, I guess, wanted to start by saying that um, we're going to talk in detail about a data product uh, that was developed by Bev and her team, um, and that's going to be kind of the main event, but I'll start off by just giving a bit of background about our business unit and some examples of the kind of work that we've done particularly with a view to talking about how we've used data um, to support policy, given the topic of conversation. Um, I formerly had an evaluation role. I don't currently have an evaluation role, um, but a lot of our work, we are very quantitative, quantitatively focused, um, but a lot of our work sort of feeds into evaluation and can be quite useful um, for evaluation, um, which I thought um, would be worth mentioning given we're sitting in a room full of evaluators. So I will touch on um, a couple of um, points where I can see there are like some obvious links with evaluation work, um, but I guess I'm also acknowledging that this is not really a, a presentation that's solely about evaluation. It's primarily about um, the data that we have and how we use it. Um, and then having a look at the development of a, a data product that evolved in response to questions we were getting about um, the pandemic and the impacts of that pandemic on family violence. So having said all that, um, we both work in a um, business unit within the Department of Justice in Victoria um, called um, Evidence and Insights. Evidence and Insights um, contains um, the Victorian Crime Statistics Agency, which um, is probably where all of our public facing um, data and information sits. Um, and that's also um, wherever we can, we do try to publish our work via that channel. Uh, and it also has stacks and stacks of data on it. So um, if you want to have a look at our website, feel free. Um, so the Crime Stats Agency commenced operations um, back in 2015. Um, it has a legislated function and is responsible for processing, analysing and publish um, Victorian crime statistics. Um, and importantly, that role is independent of Victoria Police. So although we sit within the department, um, we do have an independent function, which means we have a mandate to use Victoria Police data and to provide it to the public. Um, so our strategic objectives are to improve the accessibility of crime statistics for all Victorians, strengthen the integrity and quality of recorded crime data and instill public confidence in crime statistics. Um, and that was particularly important when we first came on board because prior to that, um, I mean, part of our reason for being is that there was some con controversy around whether Victoria Police were accurately reporting um, crime statistics um, and 
So Victoria moved to align itself with a lot of other states that had a kind of independent um, reporting function. Um, to build an evidence base to support decision making and policy development and to provide tools that improve the statistical literacy of stakeholders and clients. Um, so the Crime Statistics Agency um, Act establishes the role of my boss or our boss, the chief statistician, to publish and release statistical information um, and undertake research into an analysis of crime and just crime and criminal justice trends and issues, issues and trends. So um, that's kind of our public facing, um, our public facing functions. Um, However, we also have a bit of an internally facing work program, um, which I'll run you through um, in a couple of slides. So this is just an overview of um, some of the public facing stuff. We have stacks and stacks of data um, available via our website. If you're doing very sort of high level policy analysis or evaluation, some of that data can be useful. Um, and, you know, you can look at things that might have changed over time in terms of new offences coming on board and how that might have impacted the crime rate and those kinds of things. Um, but we do do a quarterly publication of a broad range of statistics. And we also um, do customised data requests for the public, government, media and academics. Um, so we, I think we do about a thousand data requests a year. Um, I think it's slowed down a little bit. The more data we put on our website, the less requests we get, which is great. <laughs> um, but um, we still do get a lot of requests um, for data. So that is a service that's available um, to anyone. Um, small data requests are free of charge. And then I think there's a very small charge if, if there's sort of an estimate that it will go more than a, that it will take more than a couple of hours of work. Um, so if we move on to the next one, Bev. So the other thing that we do is we use the data that we have to do research um, and publish research on topics of interest for Victoria and topics of policy relevance. So, um, for example, and we also have done some in that sort of vein. We, I wouldn't call them full evaluations because I know I'm in a room of evaluators, but we have done some what I would call statistical outcome evaluations um, using um the data that we have available to us so we kind of want to maximize the value of it so an example of one of those for um would be a study that we did a while back about the impact or the the differences between the giving a, a young person who's committed an offense the police have an option to give them a caution or like a warning or they have an option to charge them with a crime and they go to court and they go down that route. So we did um, an evaluation, just a statistical um, outcome study comparing um, reoffending outcomes for kids who are given a caution versus reoffending outcomes for kids who are charged with a criminal offence. Um, in terms of our other publications, I think there's an example there. Um, and um, it just shows um, some analysis. We did looking at the criminal trajectories over the first um, seven years of a young person's offending. Um, and we identified several different types of groups. And the vast majority of young people who are offenders um, are very, very low level offenders and don't sort of go on to, um, to be involved in a lot of crime. So that kind of research that we do informs, I suppose, um, the different types of policy responses that might be required for different subgroups of young people. Um, next slide, Bev. Oh, I don't think we were gonna do that one. Oh, is this the latest version? Oh. <laughs> Sorry. I think it was our shared version. Okay. Unless it's not updated. Okay. All right, I'll just Sorry, talk. Before you interrupted a bit there yeah. as well. Um, James has just asked if you can also just put it into presentation view. It's just a bit, I think, small for some. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can give it a go. Um, I'm not used to Teams, so we'll see if um, if it still ends up casting all right. Can you see it okay? Uh, no, that's the presentation view. Um, just go yeah, down. You want to actually switch to um, full screen view. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, it's because I'm sharing a particular, I've got two monitors and I'm sharing a monitor and I don't know oh, how to swap okay. the display. Um, uh, if you just, um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. there we go. Oh, bingo, yes, Beautiful. we can see now. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so before Bev moves on to this slide, I'll just um, briefly say that um, a couple of other things we do are bespoke sort of research and analysis pieces using linked data. Um, to inform policy. So an interesting kind of example of that that we've done recently is informing the government's response to the repeal of um, public drunkenness in Victoria. Um, so we use the police data to inform the design of a service that would replace police responding to public drunkenness as a criminal offence um, and instead would provide a health-based response. So we essentially looked at um, all of the data we had on people who'd previously been um, recorded by police for public drunkenness, um, looked at what their service needs might be, what their characteristics might be, um, uh, where they might get um, arrested by police for public drunkenness. And that's been um, used a lot to inform, you know, what capacity do we need to have for services in different areas? Um, what are the likely needs of the people coming into contact with those services? Um, and in that work, um, unsurprisingly, probably we found um, that from the data, two cohorts of people emerged. There were a group of people who you could essentially say were your, like people who were out on a Saturday night, they're only um, ever recorded by police for a singular offence. They didn't tend to be recorded for other offences and they didn't tend to have a lot of service needs. Um, and then we found what we called our high intensity cohort. And these people were people who were arrested several times a year for public drunkenness, um, were also in contact with mental health services, um, also in contact with homelessness services. Um, but, um, and we looked at sort of where police were finding those people across the state um, and how that might inform um, what they needed to design in terms of an alternative service delivery response. So that was just one that I thought was a good example of how our data has been used to inform policy. Um, but having said all that, the other thing that we do at the Crime Stats Agency is um, release the Victorian Family Violence Database and manage that. So I will hand over to my colleague, Beverly, who is the expert in all things family violence data um, and let her um, run you through that. Thanks, Melanie. Um, so as Melanie sort of alluded to, um, the project that I work on full time at the Crime Statistics Agency is the Family Violence Database. I've been working on it for the past four years and um, the COVID-19 Family Violence Data Portal is a component of that work. Um, and that's sort of what I'll be focusing on tonight. But I wanted to give a bit of a background about what the database project is. Um, and sort of how it came to be and came to land at our agency. And then we'll talk a bit about um, the COVID-19 portal, which is part of that work. Um, so the Family Violence Database actually has been around for a little while. Um, it sort of, its origins come from a Victorian government inter interdepartmental committee on violence against women. And um, they first identified sort of a need that to create a database which would help facilitate a system-wide view of family violence data in Victoria. Um, so way back in 2000, um, they began to undertake some of this work thanks to some seed funding from the Com Commonwealth Government's Partnership Against Domest Domestic Violence Program. Um, the very first publication of the database came out in 2002. So we're coming up to our 20th um, year anniversary of publications. Um, but from that first publication, the subsequent work was a bit sporadic, as you can see. So it took another four years for another publication to come out. Um, in 2007, a third edition came out, and, but the project was relocated to the then Department of Justice. Um, between 2007 and 2012, um, a few more publications came out. But after the fifth publication in 2012, it was, you know, then silent for a number of years, um, including up to the Royal Commission into Family Violence, which took place in Victoria um, in 2015 and 16. So um, the Royal Commission noted the value of the database um, during, um, during their hearings um, and in fact made a recommendation to 
um, continue that work under a more sort of routine and regular funding arrangement and publication cycle. So one of the recommendations of the Royal Commission, I believe it was 206, was um, for the Family Violence or for the Crime Statistics Agency to undertake that work. Um, and since 2016, the project has landed in our office, um, and it now exists on the Crime Statistics Agency website um, as a sort of umbrella term resource for a number of publications that we update annually. So what is the purpose of the database? Um, I've sort of summarized it very briefly um, that reliable and accessible data helps to create informed policies. Um, so there was a recognition, including by the Royal Commission, that the database helps bring visibility to trends, data gaps, and system weaknesses through cross-sector analysis. And because of that, it's a valuable tool for developing evidence-based policy around family violence. Um, really, in, in its um, rudimentary form, it's sort of an, an aggregation or collation of family violence data from a number of different sectors across the VPS. And so just having all of that information in one easy to access place is a lot, or is a big help um, to people in the research and evaluation and policy areas to just access data um, more readily. Um, this is a quote that I've taken from the, the Royal Commission, um, which is just says, our understanding of family violence and the response to it could be improved by making existing data sets and research efforts more accessible, conducting further analysis of existing data, increasing links between data sets and where necessary, augmenting existing efforts. And so those are really some of the goals that we're trying to achieve with the, the Family Violence Database um, project with the view that making data more accessible in turn will then help um, a number of um, the different research and evaluation and policy areas that need to access that data. Um, so this is where the database lives on the Crime Statistics Agency website now. You can find most of our work under the heading of Family Violence Data Portal. The bulk of our annual work will fall under the data dashboards and data tables. Um, so this houses data from about 10 different sources across the Victorian public sector. Um, and it's updated annually and we report on financial year figures. So you'll get sort of aggregate totals um, by financial year of a number of different measures of family violence. Um, we also have interactive infographics, which you can um, augment to look at uh, different local government areas in Victoria. Um, and so that's for uh, information from a few of our data sources, including Victoria Police. Um, we've also produced a few research publications, which you'll find under the research and evaluation area of our website. And so we've got two that have come out in the past few years, one on adolescent aggressors of family violence and one on child witnesses of family violence. Um, we've called them data snapshots and they're really just a high level look at some of the characteristics um, under those topics. And then of course today, We've also produced the COVID-19 Family Violence Data Portal. And so that's what I'll sort of be focusing on for the rest of the talk. Um, the COVID-19 Family Violence Data Portal, it was developed as a component of the Family Violence Database, um, really just meaning it's the same team and same funding um, that's responsible for the database that um, in turn produced this sort of specialized product. Um, it was developed in response to an identified need for accessible, accessible data concerning family violence incidents and service use during COVID-19 and the related restrictions. So if we think way back to March 2020, when most of us were sort of being sent to work from home, um, even then there was an early recognition that um, for victim survivors of family violence, home isn't necessarily a safe place to be and all of us were being asked to spend a lot more time in the home. Um, so right at the beginning of the restrictions, there was, um, I think a warranted increased concern about um, the incidents and, and service needs for people affected by family violence and whether those needs would be met. Um, so we realized that there was in turn a need for more visibility around the data concerning family violence. And as I've mentioned, um, our regular publications are only updated once a year, and we really focus most of our analysis um, within financial years. So it, the tools that were existing in the family violence database weren't really going to be sensitive enough to provide a focused look um, 
at the impact that COVID-19 and the related restrictions were having on, um, on family violence incidents and service use. So um, really the process for us to create the portal, um, we've got a governance committee for the family violence database work. Um, so we created a project proposal and it was accepted by our governance committee. Um, when we got the go ahead to commence this work, we then developed a report and access framework um, through consultation with a number of our stakeholders. That's sort of just a fancy way of saying we went around to a lot of the people that were asking for this information and tried to get a sense of exactly what they'd like to see in, in, um, in a data platform. Um, so a few themes emerged from that exercise. Um, firstly, there was a really big interest in how priority communities were affected. And when I say priority communities, that's really referring to um, a number of different cohorts or groups of people that we know to be data gaps in, in relation to family violence. Um, and so they're a priority very much from a data sense in that we don't know a lot um, about how family violence affects these groups. Um, and so that includes um, communities like um, children and young people, people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, um, people aged 55 and older, people with a disability and so forth. Um, so a lot of information in particular about how those groups were affected. There was also, especially in the early days, a lot of interest around mode of access to services. Um, so a lot of service delivery, of course, traditionally in the family violence um, space is face to face. Um, but as the restrictions were amping up, um, of course, the ability to provide face-to-face -face service was impacted. And so there's a lot of interest around how helplines were affected by um, just an increased demand on remote-based work. Um, and in addition to that, how, how website use was going up, um, use of web chats and quick ex ex exit buttons and things like that. Um, so a lot of interest in some of those sort of non-traditional format um, based services. There's also an interest in sexual violence and, and um, whether or not that was increasing amidst some of the restrictions, particularly within the family violence context. Um, one of the things I think we've seen in some of the more um, severe restrictions is that some of the traditional crimes that might happen in the community were then um, still taking place in some instances, but instead um, violence directed in the home. And so I think that was the basis for some of the interest around sexual violence. And this last one um, is uh, something that emerged particularly as we were doing um, analysis on the data re we received, but um, there was an interest and consideration even contextually around disruption to traditional referral pathways. So what I mean by this is um, within the family violence sector broadly, there's typically a few places where victim survivors or perpetrators might first be identified and then moved into um, the service sector. Police are of course a huge gatekeeper, um, but a really interesting sort of case that's emerged, uh, particularly amidst COVID um, for children would be um, a, a, a large source of referrals to child protection is schools. And so um, one of the disruptions we saw early on um, as schools closed was the number of reports made to child protective services went down. And that's sort of just become interesting um, because sometimes we might look to administrative data um, to give us an indication sort of of community prevalence of certain types of abuse, but we also have to contextualize that with what's happening in the background. And if some of these referral pathways are disrupted, it's of course gonna have an impact on um, some of the administrative data we might look um, as, as an indicator of, of prevalence. Um, and so just important contextual information to keep in mind when doing analysis on the data. Um, in terms of continuing developing the portal, we then had to engage with data providers. Um, in the end, about 20 different data sources um, agreed to contribute to the COVID-19 portal, which really was um, probably the biggest component of the success of this project. Um, really uh, was quite pleased that um, so many people were not only happy to share their data, but were really keen and excited to get on board. Um, and, and a product like this wouldn't have been possible without um, the support of a lot of the, the different sector workers 
who were um, happy to provide us with data to support the project. And then of course, final stage of development was the actual product build, which we did in Power BI um, and was then published to the CSA website. Um, some of the challenges that emerged while we were building the data portal, and perhaps this will be relevant if any of you go on to, to tackle a similar project, but um, one of the early challenges we faced was um, a need to keep the information in a public facing platform quite simple and consistent and digestible without being misleading. Um, and just keeping in mind that we've got about 20 sources. So um, easier said than done, we learned, um, because data, of course, comes in in all kinds of different formats. Um, some information isn't able to be broken down in the similar way, some sources. Um, will define family violence differently. Some will have, you know, certain disruptions going on. Um, and so I think a big takeaway from that is just the need to frame information with a lot of contextual details um, and explanatory notes as well, which we've tried to do in the portal. Um, in addition to that, uh, for those of us in Victoria, we'll be well aware that it was a rapidly changing environment. Um, we began this work in March um, and it was published in November and a lot of things happened in Victoria between those times um, and you know, changing priorities came about um, even just in terms of what we would have found interesting in the data, um, which was a bit of a challenge um, and sort of links in with tight timeframes as well. So there was certainly a demand for very timely data and um, while quarterly data under regular cir or, um, circumstances is, um, you know, pretty impressive. Um, in Victoria at that time, when re re uh, restrictions were changing so fast, um, by the time we published data, you know, ending in um, May if we or June, if we published it in November, it already felt quite stale because we did experience just um, so many changes in between that time. So certainly some of the, the challenges that we faced, um, but I think overall we've been able to achieve, um, you know, something more robust than what we typically produce on an annual basis. Um, just to go over some of the general things that we found along the way. So the COVID portals existed um, for three cycles now. So we've done three quarterly updates and I'll give a very broad overview of some of the things that we found when looking at the different quarters. Um, and just to refresh everybody's memory, so this is um, what we found between March to June. Um, and around that time is when the very first restrictions began to emerge in Victoria. So um, stage one to three restrictions took place um, rather quickly. First school closures took place around that time. Closing of venues, um, we all started working from home in March, or many of us did, I should say. Um, operation Ribbon, which was an operation um, that Victoria Police undertook um, to increase proactive monitoring of known um, prolific family violence offenders commenced in April. Um, and then in May, restrictions began relaxing. So schools reopened in May 26th and restaurants reopened early June. So there's a lot going on in this first quarter, um, both in terms of amping up and winding down restrictions. Um, and so really trying to look at the quarter as a whole was a bit difficult, um, but we found some trends more looking at month on month. Um, so many of our sources at that time, particularly emergency sources, um, saw the largest growth in cases when compared to the prior year in June. Um, so there is a bit of a spike, particularly um, in Victoria Police data, um, as well as um, a number of our helplines as well. Um, in a separate paper that the CSA undertook, we did a bit of forecasting analysis and we found that that June spike was significantly different than what we've seen in the past. Um, so certainly um, interesting changes happening as the restrictions were winding down in June. Um, we also found that a number of breach of order offenses were taking place at that time. Um, another theme that sort of emerged in this quarter was the growth in um, our cohort of people aged 55 and older. So a number of our um, sources reporting actually saw an increase in victim survivors aged 55 and older. 
in our Victoria Police data, that cohort grew by about 19.4%. And actually, the co or the subset of people um, in that cohort whose perpetrator was a child, including adult child of the victim, um, grew by about 50% in June. So some big growths. But just to contextualize it, um, the growth of that cohort was from about 1,100 people to 1,700. So it was a growth of about um, 603 incidents when comparing 2019 to 2020. Relatively small numbers still overall in a small subset of our Victoria Police data. But we felt um, it was an interesting trend that emerged in that quarter and, um, and certainly um, seemed to be um, something that was consistent across a few of our contributing sources. In July to September, to sort of refresh um, on the restrictions, um, return to remote learning sort of commenced in August um, and restrictions began to be reinstated. So this quarter ended up housing some of our most severe restrictions um, and probably the most severe restrictions in the world. Um, at one point I'd heard that. Um, so uh, I think the state of disaster was declared in August um, and that's where the stage four restrictions took place as well. So those of us in Victoria may well remember um, when we virtually weren't allowed to leave our homes at all. Um, really, this is the quarter where a lot of disruptions were evident, um, particularly in court and legal and child protection services, although that's also true for um, some of the restrictions that took place in um, the uh, March to June quarter. Um, so finalized family violence intervention orders went down about 42% in August um, and duty lawyer services provided by um, Victoria Legal Aid went down about 53%. Um, we've sort of received advice and I think it's been documented in the paper as well, just um, as the transition to um, remote based court was taking place um, that was having an impact in some of those traditional in person services, but the other side of that is that we saw an uptake of interim family violence intervention orders. So it's not necessarily to say that victims weren't being protected during this time. Um, in addition to that, um, the number of investigations being brought to the attention of child protection went down about 40% um, in August as well, potentially related to some of the school closures happening around that time. The other services in this time period were a bit varied, unremarkable. Um, difficult to say what the trends were in them. Um, we saw an increase in some services, um, particularly Victoria Police around August. But um, I think when we've done a, our, some of our forecasting analysis on it, um, didn't necessarily see any um, remarkable spikes around that time. And then of course, October to December, this quarter was recently released on our website as of last Friday. Um, this is where we saw a lot of the restrictions begin to, to lift. So roadmap to recovery, I believe, began at the end of September. Face-to-face um, -face learning resumed, I think, the 12th of October. And throughout October to December, there was continued easing of restrictions. Um, so at the end of December, there was outdoor gatherings um, and venues reopened um, and with capacity restrictions. We also in this quarter saw evidence of recovery amidst court services and child protection services. So in particular, for the first time, finalized family violence intervention orders met about the numbers that they were at in 2019 um, as of November. So evidence that they're catching up to, I think what's been called the backlog in applications, um, similar with child protective services and that we've seen an increase in the number of investigations commenced. Um, and then some increased activity noted in October, um, particularly in Victoria Police. And again, um, some of these increases um, with the family violence related crimes seem to be sort of more clustered to, around breach of order offenses, which, um, which were increasing. So I'll now attempt to transition to show you the live portal, if I can get my share screen working. Can everybody see this all right? Yep, it's good for oh, me. Great, thanks. 
So um, as I've mentioned, this is the COVID-19 portal that lives on the Crime Statistics Agency website. Um, I won't take you through all of the analysis, but um, I'll just sort of show you the different components and I'd encourage you to take a look and have a play for yourself about everything that's um, living in here. So we've clustered our analysis sort of under three broad headings. Um, you can look at analysis by sector. In this section, we've sort of broken down um, all of our 20 odd sources into different um, sectors or types of services that are provided. Um, we've got a little filter here where you can select which data source you're interested in. And there's a few different ways you can look at the trends. Um, so this is just a month on month um, trend line for 2019-20 data. You can look also at percentage, month on month percentage changes and do comparisons with the other sources that are clustered um, within um, the, the selected sector. Um, and we've got our key findings and then information about the data and um, links to related material about that source. Um, so we've broken the sectors down into emergency services, helplines, um, housing services, which includes um, homelessness data collection data um, and um, requests for accommodation. We've also got some data from VCAT, which is only broken down at a financial year level, um, but relates, relates to lease changes under the family violence sections of the Residential Tenancy Act. Um, information services is just uh, data that we've got about website usage. Um, and then we've also got legal services, which is family violence related services performed by Victoria Legal Aid. Um, we've got information on family violence protection orders. Um, so that includes family violence safety notices, which are a specialized order issued by Victoria Police, um, as well as interim orders, um, finalized orders. And then you can even look at the total number of people as at the last date of a month that are on any kind of family violence specific order. Um, and then everything else that sort of doesn't fit into the clusterings above um, generally falls under specialist services. So here we've got child protection data. We've got um, family and domestic fam specialist services um, that are funded through the homelessness data collection. Um, and then we've got some other um, specialist services. So in touch is a subset of our family and domestic violence services, but they're a specific service for people from culturally and linguistically diverse um, backgrounds. We've also got safe steps, um, which has sort of been the 24 hour response throughout COVID um, and a few other services, the Seniors Rights Victoria and Victim Assistance Program. And then in other sources, we've got just um, some breakdowns for federal circuit courts and, and family court data, as well as Department of Home Affairs. Um, we've got a little bit of data about um, family violence claims made um, for applicants or holders of temporary or provisional partner visas. Um, the second sort of um, umbrella sort of heading that we've clustered our analysis under is analysis by location. So this, um, you can look at a, a few different populations of data, typically Victoria Police or protective order data, um, broken down by LGA. If you're interested in LGA measures, um, you can look at month by month rates um, or just the, the quarter analysis for the fourth quarter of 2020. You can also break the um, location-based information down by a few different um, ABS structures. So remoteness area looks basically categorizes areas based on um, their remoteness or their um, accessibility to services. Um, so you can look at data that way. Um, we've also included a breakdown by the index of relative social economic advantage and disadvantage. So that um, ranks different areas according to um, how advantaged or disadvantaged an area is. Um, so you can look at sources that way. Uh, the third sort of like um, breakdown of analysis we did was, of course, for our priority communities. We haven't included everybody, um, all of the communities that we wanted. Um, in some cases, it's just very difficult to find reliable data on some of the communities we're interested in. But we were able to put something together for children and young people, people aged 55 and older, 
culturally and linguistically diverse communities um, and Aboriginal people. So we've got access to um, some data on those particular cohorts that you can explore in the portal as well. We've got a few different other pools of information if you're um, interested in exploring the portal as well. Um, we put together some infographics um, just highlighting some of the services and priority groups, um, some of the key data in those sections. We've also got a directory of Australian publicly available research um, and data resources um, that's related to COVID-19 and family violence or related themes. So if you're looking for some papers on a particular topic around COVID-19 um, that's publicly available in Australia, then you can check this out. Um, we've got sort of research themes that you can check here and it'll show you um, just the, the different papers we've been able to find on it. So that might be a helpful resource if you're interested. Finally, um, we've got a few other little downloadable resources. We've put together a summary sheet about all of the different restrictions that were in place in Victoria um, from way back in the beginning in March through until the end of December. We've also got just a fact sheet um, with some explanatory information on the data. And we've got a resource here to download um, most of the trend data that exists in our portal. So if you, you're interested in any of the trend data and you wanna download it for yourself, um, you can do that in the portal in this area.